Korea, beautiful part in the world, and this really nice conference. I'm really enjoying it a lot. Um, I, I'm trying to be a biophysicist. I'm mainly working on soft matter physics, uh, and I'm trying to do some stuff on biophysics. And I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about today about uh, some work I've been involved with during a sabbatical leave at, uh, at Caltech, uh, as well as uh, you know some collaboration with uh, old friends at, at UCLA. So. The official title of my talk is Dynamics of In Vivo Bacteriophage uh, Ejection, Genome Ejection. And the popular, the, the popular uh, title is How to Move in a Crowd. Because I will show you that in vivo ejection of, uh, of a genome, of, uh, of a phage genome in uh, a live bacteria, um, there's a short term, so there's a short range behavior which you know, is, is, is driven by the pressure in the phage. But there's a, there's a long time behavior as well. And that behavior has to do with the properties of the, uh, of the cytoplasm. And that property is you know, mainly uh, crowdedness, as we'll show you in, in a minute. So that's, why, uh, so that's where the, 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 the popular title comes from, how to move in a crowd. <laughs> All right, um, so this is a crowd. This is the crowd I've been working with, with uh, um, Ms. Yiru. She was a grad student when I was working in, at, at Caltech. And, uh, and Rob Phillips, I think is familiar to a lot of you, wrote, wrote a beautiful book about uh, physical biology. Uh, these are two old friends. It goes back more than 20 years ago when I was a postdoc at UCLA, and they also moved to, to virus work. So that was a really uh, nice and uh, an inspiring collaboration. Um, but just to start, um, phages. Probably most of you are aware of it. Nevertheless, I'll give you an introduction. Uh, it's also my task to keep you awake after, uh, after the lunch. Uh, I hope I will give you away, keep you awake by saying something that you may already know. Uh, but, you know, I would like to give you the introduction. The introduction is always good, right? So, um, the a phage is a, a protein capsid that contains genetic material, the genome. Uh, it lands on the surface or of, of the membrane of a bacterium where it binds to uh, typical proteins or, uh, or sugars on, the, on, on these membranes. And then it ejects its, its genome. Uh, so here's a schematic picture, here's a real picture. And the life cycle is actually, you have these phages that land onto the bacterial surface, they inject their DNA. The bacterium, you know, using the uh, uh, reproduction, reproduction machine, machi machinery of the bacterium, um, new protein, phage proteins are being generated, and new phage heads, and uh, you get new phages at some point the bacterium lyses or explodes, and the cycle is closed. Right? Uh, now, Dennis will be talking about, the, in the next session, he will be talking about how DNA gets inside, again, inside these phages. And now we'll talk about how it gets out, all right? So, uh, uh, probably, probably all, this is a historical thing. So, this, the, it, it's a pretty famous experiment, I think, although I wasn't aware of it up to about a few years ago, the Hershey Chase experiment. That was one of the experiments uh, that helped confirming that, in fact, DNA is a genetic material or hereditary material. Uh, and it, it is a very smart experiment. A long time ago, 1952, um, about a year before Watson and Crick you know, wrote, they published their paper on the, on the alpha helix structure of uh, DNA. But still, at that time, there was still some debate whether uh, DNA constitutes really the genetic, the genetic material of organisms. And the argument, the counter-argument of that was, in fact, that DNA is so simple, it couldn't code for these complications that, you know, that organisms uh, display, right? Uh, not even, even bacteria, but particularly uh, higher organisms. Uh, but this is typically um, a proof, I think a very, very nice and, and elegant proof. Uh, so they radioactively labeled the sulfur groups in the proteins of, uh, of these phages, and they also radioactively labeled the phosphorus bits in the DNA. Then they could show that the DNA is, in fact, in the bacterium, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the protein is outside the bacterium. So that was a really uh, an additional confirmation that DNA is really the hereditary material and not protein, right? I'll get back to the Hershey Chase experiment in, uh, in a minute. Uh, so the, the and the it's pretty. So I will I will talk about the easy part, right? So how DNA gets out. And initially, it's pretty easy for DNA to get out, but because it's highly pressurized, so it's wrapped inside the phage head. So we have, for example, for lambda DNA, 
Uh, the contour length of, uh, of 50,000 base pairs, 50 kilo base pairs of DNA is about 17 micron. Right? Then these phase heads are about so 30, 30 nanometers. Right? So that's like the, if you have a cable, you spin it over the Golden Gate Bridge, and you try to wrap it into, uh, into a van. Right? And, and it's not a very thin cable. So uh, these are huge, so there's a lot of pressure uh, involved in, the, in, in stacking or, or, or having um, DNA packed into, the, into these phase heads by 50, 60 atmosphere. Uh, so here you see, so this is uh, automatically lysed phage, and here you see all the DNA that's supposed to be in the phage head. So it's, it's enormous uh, disparity of, uh, of length scales in that sense. So this is what, what you can call a, a, single a single molecule Hershey Chase experiment. So this is stuff I will be mainly uh, talking about. Uh, the question uh, we address, or what Rob and his collaborators already addressed, is what the mechanism is of phage DNA translocation. So um, it is proved by Hershey and Chase indeed that DNA is the carrier of genetic information. Now the question is how does it work? What is the mechanism, right? Can we quantitatively describe that? What are the time scales, for example? Uh, and the, I think the experiment that they did is really elegant and, and smart. So what they did is they labeled phage DNA with uh, so-called cytox orange. And that's a dye that cannot penetrate the, the bacterial membrane. So the inside of the bacterium only gets fluorescent if DNA penetrates, penetrates the membrane by other means, right? It's not a spontaneous process. Uh, so at the beginning of a phage infection, um, there will be all the fluorescence will be in the phage and not in the bacterium. And on, on a later stage, uh, the bacterium will uh, you know, continuously become more uh, more fluorescent, and the bacteria and the phage head will become uh, less fluorescent. So this is a schematical picture of of how that's supposed to go. Um, yeah. So, and then a priori. So for some people, this is probably a familiar picture, right? Uh, so a priori, you could think about what physical effects influence the dynamics of phage action over the the speed of how DNA is translocated from a phage to uh, a bacterium. Uh, so, of course, it's a stored energy in the, uh, if so there's like the very closely packed DNA uh, that constitutes a huge, uh, a huge driving force for ejection. And I think it's safe to say that in, in vivo ejection is the main driving force, right? It's, it's, all, it's almost all there is. Uh, and then, of course, there are other things that the, there are the properties of the solvent or the cytoplasm, like the osmotic pressure, uh, other macromolecules, salt, you know, divalent ions, you name it. All these things are, are important. And there's also something, potentially there's also something else, and that's so-called um, ratcheting proteins. So the idea is that, you know, at, at the first stage of, uh, of DNA ejection, the process is relatively fast because it's driven by the, uh, by the internal pressure. But then after a while, when the pressures, uh, you know, when the driving force becomes comparable to the turgo pressure in, in the bacterium, it gets slower. And the idea is that there are so-called ratcheting proteins that very strongly bind to the DNA that comes out of the phage so that it doesn't get back, right? So it rectifies, in fact, the motion, right? I'm not going to defend it in detail because, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, this is a spoiler, but I'm going to show that probably those things don't play a role, at least for, for lab phage. But they could, they could be there, right? So they could... You know, this is one of the aspects that could be important in the in phage ejection or in DNA ejection by phages. Um, so this is a typical, and I have to learn to the computer to show it. So this is a typical movie. If it worked, yes, it does. So it's a little fast, but we, you, you see that in the beginning, oh, in the beginning, all the fluorescence in the phage head. So this is a phage that sits onto a bacterium. Here's the bacterium. So all the fluorescence is in the phage head. There's no fluorescence here. And then after a while, in the order of minutes, there's a redistribution of uh, fluorescence, right? And you can tell here that it's on the, on, on the, on the order of, of minutes. So let's say in five minutes, most of the DNA uh, is out. Uh, there's also a lot of noise, uh, but that's a different story. Uh, so, the, um, schematically, it looks like this. So, at first, all the fluorescence in the phage head, and then gradually, uh, there's a redistribution of, uh, of fluorescence that coincides with the redistribution of the, of the DNA. And these are some typical stills. Um, 
Now, in vitro, the situation is much faster, and I'm, I'm going to show you that uh, as well, because here, you see it really goes, oh, well, let me first, let me first stop and tell you what the idea of the, uh, what the, uh, what I'm, what, what I'm actually showing you. So the setup is that you have phages um, adsorbed onto uh, microscopy, microscope cover slips, and then there's a flow of uh, gold particles that stick to DNA, right? so they're be being visualized. And the idea of the flow is that it kind of stretches the DNA when it comes out of these phages, and these LAMB initiates, let's say, the uncorking of the, of the phage. So it binds to the, it's like a receptor that binds to the, to the phage tail, and that induces uh, ejection of the, of the DNA. So that's the setup. And here are some typical movies. This is a typical movie. You see it goes very fast. Uh, you, I'm inviting you to look over here, because here you see how it triggers and how it, here it goes, and then bang! So it's like seconds, right? So it's a, it's a second or two seconds. And compared to, uh, to in, in vivo, it's extremely fast, right? So there's a huge difference, or huge, well, there's at least an order of magnitude difference in, uh, in time scale of the injection process. Um, and there's more, as, I, as I, will, I will be showing you later. There's some more pictures over here, uh, just because I, I like them. So the, here, here are some stills of the process. You can see how it goes, uh, gradually, in time. And so this is seconds, right? So it's relatively, as I will show you later, this is fast compared to, uh, uh, no, I'll show you here. It's fast compared to in vivo experiments. Um, and also there are differences, right? Because it, depending on the, uh, uh, the, the kind of ions in the, uh, in the, uh, in, the in vitro uh, system, it goes faster or, or slower. Right? So it's, it's very sensitive to the, uh, to the counter ions and another other th a lot of other things. All right, so this is, I think this is really very beautiful and elegant uh, way to uh, get grip on what the driving force really is, and it's using osmotic pressure. I'm a physical chemist by training, so I I'm, you know, appreciate the, the smartness of this, of this setup. So what these authors did, um, I think many of them are here, right? So Alex is here and Bill is here, um, and uh, they're, so, um, Avi, you were also involved in that, right? At least in the early, early stage. And uh, so the idea is to have a, um, an, so they call it the ospolite. That's a, that's a relatively long polymer that cannot penetrate the, uh, the phage uh, tail. So it, it exerts effectively an osmotic pressure. And by playing with the osmotic pressure of the, of the osmolites, um, these, these people were able to, um, to, um, to stop ejection at some point. So it stops at the point where the pressures are equal, right? And you know, one of these pressures is being set by the concentration of the ospolites. And by that, you could, it's where, the, where, the, where the ejection stops. That's a measure, in fact, for the pressure inside these phage heads. And I think that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful experiment. Um, now back to uh, where I really want to, uh, to talk about. Back to in vivo, right? Um, it's more complicated. And uh, this is an experiment of uh, two mutants of lepta uh, phage with E. coli. Uh, long chain length, the blue ones, short chain length, uh, the red ones. And this is the ejection velocity, so kilobase per, per minute, as a function of the DNA that's inside the capsid. And a priori, the idea was that the DNA inside the capsid determines the driving force, and that in principle determines the ejection speed. Uh, they're two, well, the curves have the same shape, but you know, they're different curves because they're different DNA, right? Now, if you look carefully, so the first thing to think about is what, what, the, relevant, um, what, what the relevant quantity or the relevant parameter is to study, right? the relevant uh, the description. And if you look at these curves, you can tell that if you translate that red one about 10 kilobase pairs, that's about the difference between these two mutants, they coincide, right? Now, if you do that, that's typically the difference between these two mutants. That means that the starting points also coincide, right? Uh, and starting point here means here's DNA in the capsid, so here's no DNA in the bacterium, right? So the idea is if you translate it, first you shift the curves, and then you flip it, you will get universal for two curves uh, behavior. Uh, if you take the parameter uh, DNA ejected, right? 
So here's how it looks like. So you shift it and flip it. So then you plot the ejected DNA rather than the DNA in the capsid. Uh, and then you see that on a relatively long time, uh, these curves coincide. Right? At the beginning, there's a difference. And that makes sense because that larger um, genome, of course, exerts a larger uh, osmotic pressure. So the speed is so it's faster. right? But in the longer run, that was, uh, it was unexpected. Right? Um, so typically, so that means that since, in fact, the, the relevant parameter, at least experimentally, is the, the, the properties of the ejected DNA as well as the properties of the bacterial cytoplasm that set the time scale for ejection here in these relatively long times. All right. Um, so, and if you look at it carefully, there are two regimes, right? So there's one regime we call that pressure-driven. Dri I'll get back to that later, why I call it that. It's pressure-driven, and that's di so that's different between these two mutants. And there's another regime, we call it late stage, and I'll tell you where it comes from in a minute. So people are, uh, you know, uh, know a bit about glassy dynamics. They know where short, short stage or, and, long, uh, and, uh, and late stage come from. Um, but I will tell you that, uh, that in a minute. Uh, so you see that it, it becomes similar. You can also plot it differently. You can just plot the, um, the number of, of ejected base pairs as a function of time and take the logarithm for both. And then you clearly see two regimes, right? There's one uh, short time regime and it has a slope of one, which means that it is, um, it's a driven process, right? So it's just constant, constant velocity, more or less. Not, not exactly, but more or less. And then here, there's another slope and that slope turns out to be 0.2, right? So one of the things we try to do is to find out, you know, to come up with a mechanism that explains the value of that slope on the long times, right? Um, all right, so let's start with the early ejections. I will mainly talk about the late stage, but let's um, summarize what we know about early ejection stage. Uh, the idea is that at early ejection stage when the um, when the, when the DNA is closely packed into the, into the phage heads and they have a typical separation between the DNA strands of the D sub S, uh, then the idea is that at these short distances is mainly hydration force uh, that determines the interaction between the, the particles. So here, and that's exponential, right? Uh, the hydration force exponential. Surely there's also electrostatics, that's also pretty important. Uh, and it's, but at, at this point, that, that, that contribution is small compared to the bending energy. Bending energy is also large on an on absolute scale, but it's small compared to uh, the hydration force at these close, at these you know, very close packings. Uh, then what you do, so this is the, typically the, the, um, the force per unit area. So if you integrate that over the typical distance uh, from infinity to the, the typical uh, separation, you will get the energy that's stored into the system. Right? And then if you take a model, at least a geometrical model for how DNA is packed, and it, people are all, I think, all uh, agree that it's hexagonally packed, uh, you can get the force just by differentiation. Right? Uh, and it turns out that the force is, uh, is an exponential force in the length of DNA. And it, you, it's not directly easy to see that this is an increasing function of the DNA length, right? Because it's minus one over the square root of LDNA, but it's an increasing function of the DNA length. It's weakly increasing compared to a real exponent, but it's 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 weakly increasing. Um, and then, also, of course, there's also a friction, right? So there's also a friction contribution, and that's typically a friction coefficient times the velocity. And we could calculate the velocity just by um, by, by force balance, right? And that, that friction factor that's also turns out that's also be exponential in the length of DNA, but with a different, slightly different coefficient than, uh, than, the, than the driving force. Uh, there, for completeness, there should also be a Stokes contribution, because you could think of the blob of DNA being ejected. Um, that also has, an, has a friction uh, effect, but at this point that we, we ignore that. It, it turns out to be a, a pretty small uh, effect. I'll get back to that later, because in late stage it becomes very important. All right, so you get the ejection speed from, and then what you do compared to, so this is all known, right? This is all work by Bill and Alex and a lot of other people. Uh, and we only, turned, you know, the only thing that we did is we, we add or we subtract the turgor pressure of the bacterium, right? And then you get a pretty good agreement for the short uh, stage, for the, uh, for the early stage ejection. Uh, 
uh, it's not totally perfect, but you know, if you choose the if you choose the quantities that are in the theory for reasonable values, it more or less it qualitatively describes what's going on. Right? So this is the ejection DNA, is, and this is the speed, and it goes to a maximum. That's because of the competition between. So the, the friction factor decays faster than the uh, driving force. So that's that's the reason why you have a maximum here. Um, so that that looks reasonable, right? They're like let's say acceptable in terms of the uh, of the of the simpleness of the of the model. Uh, but there's there's a big problem, right? And the big problem is that at some point when almost not even well a bit more than half of the DNA is being ejected, um, there's no driving force, right? So purely mechanically the process should stop at that point, right? But still it goes on, right? And that has to do with the two so this this that's uh, consistent with these two length scales or with the two time scales that I showed, that first the fast regime and the slower regime, right? Um, all right, so back to so the question that I'm addressing now, so we understand more or less the, the fast process. Now let's get to the, to the late stage uh, process. And what I'm presuming, what I'm assuming is that it, it it's, has to do with the, uh, with the dynamics or with the, with the diffusion dynamics of a blob of DNA, the ejected blob of DNA, in the bacterium cytoplasm, because we, we've already seen uh, experimentally that at some point the relevant parameter, the experimentally the relevant parameter is the amount of ejected DNA inside the bacterium. So the only quantity that can, may go into this description is the, is the properties of the DNA as well as the properties of the cytoplasm, right? Nothing else. So that's what we assume. So we assume that the, so we, you need you need to know what approximately the hydrodynamic radius is because we want to calculate at some point something like a diffusion coefficient or a, um, or a friction coefficient. Um, well, we know it's not simple self-diffusion a priori because you know there are pretty large blobs of DNA at some point. I will show you that in a minute. And we know that the cell cytoplasm is glassy, right? It's a crowded environment. Um, and we start simple by just assuming that there are no ratcheting proteins, all right? So this is the idea. So we have the so there's a blob of DNA is already out, right? And what we are presuming is that the dynamic properties or the diff, the diffusional uh, so the, the diffusion of the of these blobs determines the ejection speed, right? So that so what we need to know the eject the number of the ejected DNA in number of base pairs we call it n, it's a function of t. Then we need to know what the hydrodynamic radius of that blob is, which depends on n, which depends on t. And then we need to calculate what the diffusion coefficient is, which depends on R, depends on N, depends on T. And then you need to close the, the, the story. Right? Uh, so, well, first of all, about the size. Um, this is more or less a, it's not a proof, but it's more like an argument uh, by reductio ad absurdum. I think that's the most beautiful arguments in mathematics, right? <laughs> Personally. Uh, so it's not stretched, because we know that the size of a, of, of a bacterium is about one micron. And we know that the contour length of DNA is 70 micron. No deal, right? Also, it's not just purely a random walk, or uh, you know, it, it's not, um, or a purely self-avoiding chain. Because self-avoiding chain, the radio, of the hydrodynamic radius is given by the, so this is the persistent length times the number of base pairs to the power gamma. Gamma is about three over five, or half, whatever. Uh, that will give you, for that typical uh, DNA, about one and a half micron, right? No deal either. So it should be more condensed than either of, two, of those two. And what I'm just assuming simply is just like it's, it's close-packed. It's close-packed on the, on the scale of the persistent length. And then you get something reasonable that's about 300 nanometers. So it could be that it's even closer than that, but then you have to bend it a little bit. But I don't think there's, that, that's not necessarily problematic. It could be, be a little bit less close. That's also fine. Uh, I will show you later on at the end that the result is not very sensitive to gamma. Um, so that's good, right? Because this is kind of, it's a guess. All right. Um, and, you know, you could, you could have that smaller, um, the, the denser state just by the so-called uh, uh, nucleic associating proteins. We already uh, heard about that. Um, or rapid proteins, whatever. Uh, so now, now about the uh, <clears throat> about the cytoplasm. So I think this was you can you can say that if you're a large maker molecule and you're in, in the site in a, in a, in, a, in a cell cytoplasm, you're what you may call diffusionally challenged, right? Because diffusion is not easy 
if you're in such a high, highly viscous, uh, crowded environment. Uh, and this, this has been shown not too long ago by, uh, by this group, is Christine Jacob Wagner and Eric Dufresne. Um, and they showed that relatively large macromolecules, so say larger than 30 nanometer, if you're, if you're a typical protein, you're fine in the cell cytoplasm. It's, you know, it's self-diffusion within a couple of seconds. It's relatively fast. But if you're larger than 30 nanometers, you have a problem, right? Because there's hardly, so you see this is the mean square displacement, this is time. It's not linear, right? So even over like more than an hour, it's subdiffusional, right? Uh, here you see the same thing. Uh, they, in fact, show that the, uh, if you switch off the metabolism completely, so you can do that by some chemicals and you, you stop all the AT, ATP hydrolysis, you can just temporarily uh, put the bacterium asleep, so to speak, um, then everything stops. So the, at least for, the, for these large macromolecules, it's a typical glass. So there's no movement at all at that point, right? Um, so you may say that in, in, just summarizing, there's anomalous diffusion. Anomalous diffusion means um, a slope smaller than one. If you plot the mean square displacement as a function of time, when, it, when the cell is metabolically active, and it's in, to, in a rest when it's, in, when it's uh, inactive. So this was something I wanted to share with you because I, I, I like that. So I, I understood that there are also students here. There's something you want to hear. Um, so this is just in writing what all scientists know, right? That is, if you start studying something, you use, usually find something else, or it doesn't work, or you, you know, whatever. And usually what you, the other thing that you find is often much more interesting than what you were really looking for, right? And these guys just put it in writing because they start their paper uh, that, you know, our study began with something else, uh, and now they are going to talk about what they actually discovered, right? So I like that. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, typical solid fraction. Um, well, we have about 3 million proteins in E. coli. Uh, their volume is typically about 100 uh, cubic nanometers, so your volume fraction is about 0.3. And then I don't count the hydration layers and all these kind of things. If you, if you count that, you may be close to about a half. And we know that, for example, studies of uh, heart sphere, heart colloids that, that behave as heart spheres, at about a volume, of a frac volume fraction of, of a half, things really become slow. Right? And that's probably what's going on uh, here as well. Uh, so this is some other, so we just checked some other uh, relatively large molecules. Uh, so this is the um, logarithm of the mean square displacement. This is the logarithm of time. So this is self-diffusion. So these are some typical, so these are plasmids. These are, uh, this is lambda DNA here. Uh, and there's some other proteins, relatively large proteins here. And for all these components, the slopes are pretty close to about uh, a half. Right? So it's self-diffusion with a coefficient of about a half. It's something that I don't understand. We, it, it's something that we apparently see. I will get back to that in, the, in, in a minute. So the idea of, the, um, of that um, subdiffusion is that, for example, here if you have a, so this is this typical cytoplasm. Here is a relatively large molecule. So at, at, at short times, um, at relatively short times, before any collisions with their neighbors has, has occurred, Diffusion is it's, it's self diffusion, right? Because there's no, even at uh, even shorter times, there's a ballistic regime, but then I'm not going to talk about that. But at very short times, it's diffusional because there's no, uh, that it doesn't feel the neighbors yet, right? Um, then at intermediate times, these particles are temporarily caged by other particles, and that's called, um, so, that, that, so that, that gives rise to anomalous diffusion. And it's typically transient behavior because in these systems, if the system is fluid like, after a while, these motions randomize again, and you will get diffusion again. But now it's long-time diffusion, right? So this is typically an intermediate uh, regime. And there are also experiments, because these are hard sphere colloids, right? And you see that at relatively long time, so this is the log of the mean square displacement. This is the log of time. So at short times, it's linear. At long times, it's more or less linear. And at intermediate times, intermediate times, it's a region of anomalous diffusion. And you see here that the, it could be everything, any slope in between, uh, in between one and zero, right? Uh, and what we find in the cytoplasm, it's typically a, a half. And I don't know where that comes. Apparently, it's, you know, the, 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 these densities and these interactions between proteins in cytoplasm are such that it leads to an anomalous diffusion coefficient that is around a half. I think that's the most, that's the, 
you know, the most reasonable explanation I can, I can come up with at this point. Um, so it's still transient behavior, but transient can be very long, right? Because we have a good long life and we're all transient, right? All right, um, back to phage DNA. Um, so we assume we have anomalous diffusion so that the mean square displacement of that blob of DNA is proportional to time to the power half, with where a half is uh, to the power alpha, where alpha is equal to a half. And then we assume that the diffusion coefficient still has a Stokes-Einstein form, which is that is kt over six times pi times the uh, viscosity times the hydrodynamic radius, which, as we see, as we saw, depends on the number of um, uh, ejected base pairs, which depends on time. Um, and just put a, um, a delay factor in, right? It's an effectively larger uh, viscosity, uh, effect, uh, effectively. And it should have a unit of time to the power of one minus a half in order to have the mean square displacement being square nanometer, right? So whatever it means, it's something that is on the order 0.1, right? So that's about the difference in viscosity between uh, cell cytoplasm and, uh, and, uh, and, and water, right? Uh, so now couple the dynamics of the blob by, uh, by the ejection of DNA, but just assuming that this is the mean square displacement of the blob. Um, and that's, you know, given by uh, this and here. And that's related to the amount of ejected DNA in the system, right? So the blob dynamics determines how fast the uh, DNA is being ejected at long time, right? That's actually all I'm assuming here. Uh, so then you combine everything, you get an expression for the diffusion coefficient, which depends on the dynamic radius, which depends on the number of ejected base pairs. The number of ejected base pairs itself depends on the mean square displacement, which depends on the diffusion coefficient and time. The diffusion coefficient itself depends on n. You solve for the number of ejected base pairs. And you get something like uh, some constant times uh, time to the power uh, alpha over 2 plus gamma. And here you see as long as gamma is around one over three, at least when it's much smaller than two, it doesn't matter so much, right? You always get the same coefficient, right? So the fact that I was assuming gamma is one over three is not very sensitive for the result, right? As long as it's not one or, uh, you know, three over five, that, that will give you a difference. Then you just plug in the numbers. Uh, we predict that it, you know, the um, number of ejected base pairs is a function of time should be proportional to t to the power 0.21. So, and here, that's what you see, because here, I've, I've, I've plotted this, uh, you've, you've seen it before, but this, this is the fast regime, so this is uh, the short time regime, so this is a long time regime, and you see that the slope uh, is indeed 0.2, right? And also the prefactor, because in, in this case, I would think that even with ridiculous models, you, will, you may get a reasonable coefficient, but the prefactor is also reasonable. So and in this case, that's also important to, uh, to check that. So if we just take a viscosity of, uh, you know, in between 10 times to 100 times, uh, you know, more than in, uh, than in a simple solvent, uh, you would get a reasonable value for, for A that we get here. Um, so you can also do it in terms of velocity. It's just a matter of uh, differentiation, and it's a bit more uh, noise, but you, you will get to be predict minus 3 over 7, and we find, you know, with an error, uh, minus 4. So that's, that's, all, that's all pretty, pretty okay. Um, so this is discussion, uh, and well, conclusion. So indeed, so that late stage ejection uh, seems to be quantitatively in agreement, uh, and just with a simple diffusion scenario. And I think at this point, we don't need to uh, invoke the properties of ratcheting uh, proteins. Um, it could be that at dormant stage, the bacteria also have a dormant stage, right? So they can, they can get into a kind of hibernation uh, at some point. Uh, and it, it could very well be that that stage, in fact, it should work as a defense mechanism against phages, because we know that you know, diffusion stops at, you know, when, the, when there's no metabolic activity. So in terms of phages, a phage will only be able to, at the, you know, to um, insert about half of its genome into bacteria, and then the process stops, right? So it may be, I'm, I don't know, it could, be, it could be a mechanism. There are also other things that I didn't talk about. One of them is that Ejection is also uh, often, it's often observed that ejection goes on for a while and then it passes, right? And then it goes on again, et cetera. So, there, so, there be, so the whole ejection process is kind of irregular in, in some cases. And that could have 
to do with uh, so-called dynamic hydrogenities, because we already seen that at these length scales, or you know, maker molecules that are so large as these blobs of DNA that are half or totally ejected, they behave glassy. And we, we know in glassy systems that uh, they're dynamically heterogeneous, and that's because they're pretty closely packed, uh, so they, they hardly move. But when one particle you know, turns out to be able to move, it will just cause a cascade of other movements, right? So it's, it's a collective process. And it could be, you know, that could be the reason why uh, these, uh, these, uh, the, these pulses have been, have been observed. All right, uh, I think with that, I'd like to stop and maybe there are questions. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>